I still write poetry, but I'm free of all of that baggage, basically. Hello, Patricia here in a wet and windy Switzerland, welcoming you to the Haiku P podcast, Series 5, Episode 4. It feels like ages since I've been chatting to you. How have you been? Have you avoided the latest wretched corona variation? I do hope so. And I hope you're all keeping very well indeed. So what do I have in store for you today? Well, this week I'm joined by Alison Whipple, who I'm delighted to say will be presenting a workshop on punctuation. I had a lovely time recording it with her. And I'd really like to know what you think of it. And I'll pass your thoughts on to Alison. I have Linda's YouTube choices from the Poetry P prompt for January. And what would the podcast be without a few reminders for you? Shall we start with the reminders and get them over and done with? You have, if of course you're listening to this on the day it's published, seven days left to get your split sequence entries to the podcast. End date 28th of February 2022. Check the website for the correct email. The new emails seem to be working just fine, and if you send submissions to other emails, they run the risk of getting lost. If you're not sure what they are, check out the submission page on the website. You also have seven days to write your poem for the February Poetry P prompt on YouTube, and leave them in the comments section for Linda Ludwig, our YouTube editor, to read. Linda's choices do get published in the journal from now on. But, and this is quite important, we need to know who you are. Because I'll need to send you an email just to check you're happy to be published. And I really, really need people to volunteer to be on the judging panel for the podcast. It makes a huge difference to hear voices other than mine talk about haiku. And I know I learn from the opinion of others. So please, volunteer to join me. I promise you, it's actually quite fun. Honest. If you have a 15 to 20 second video recorded in landscape mode, which is quite important, that you think would be inspirational as a prompt for YouTube, do send it to me. Or if you have one for which you've written a haiku or senryu, I'd love to read it and see it and consider it for our haiku moment. Or the prompts on YouTube. And this feels like a good point to read you those poems which Linda chose from January and which will be in the first Poetry P journal for this year. The number of poems we're receiving on the prompt are increasing in number and Linda thinks the quality is also very good. Let's hear her choices, shall we? The Scenic Route, Not Waiting for the Rainbow the scenic route, not waiting for the rainbow. Keith Everts. Teared falls, she tames her impulsiveness. Teared falls, she tames her impulsiveness. Paul Callas. River song, the imagined voices of my children. River song. The Imagined Voices of My Children Marion Clark I remember now the Mississippi Levy, how I had to pee. I remember now the Mississippi Levy, how I had to pee. Keith Everts Linda, thanks for the time you spend reading all the poems that our lovely poets write for the prompt. And to all the poets who take the time to have a look at the prompt and to write their poetry. Thank you all very much. And you can read these poems again in the Poetry P Journal 122, scheduled for June. Sounds like a long time away, but actually it will probably fly by. And now for some more wonderful haiku this time picked by Alison Whipple to illustrate her workshop on punctuation. 
The punctuation topic was suggested by Richard L. Matter. Thanks, Richard. And thanks to him and my haiku pal Nick Hoffman, I've become very aware of punctuation in haiku over the last few months. It's become almost an obsession with me. But before Alison treats us to her workshop, which you can find in the show notes if you'd like to revisit it, let me tell you a little bit about her. In her day job, Alison teaches technical communication at Austin Community College in Texas. She's authored two poetry chapbooks, We're Smaller Than We Think We Are, in 2013, and Come Into the World Like That, in 2016. In 2018, she received an MFA in poetry, after which she became really excited by haiku. She describes it as creative recovery. I'll ask her why when we chat. She's active in the Austin Haiku Study Group, and her haiku have appeared in Autumn Moon, Cattails, First Frost, Frog Pond, and Poetry P, of course, as well as other prestigious journals. She served on the board of Borderlands, Texas Poetry Review, first as administrative director and then as president, and was co-editor of the Texas Poetry Calendar from 2016 to 18, and then again in 2020. Let me read you a very small sample of her haiku, some with and some without punctuation. Check them out in the show notes later. High noon. Homeless hands in trash cans. Turkey vultures. High noon. Homeless hands in trash cans. Turkey vultures. Haiku Universe 2017. Hanging laundry on the line. Playing chicken with the rain clouds. Hanging laundry on the line. Playing chicken with the rain clouds. Frog Pond, 43.2 Circada song all gone, one air conditioner still drones before dawn. Circada song all gone, one air conditioner still drones before dawn. The Poetry P Journal, Autumn 2021 So let's have a listen to her presentation, shall we? Alison, welcome to the podcast. And many, many thanks for volunteering to do a presentation on punctuation. I'm really grateful for that. In my introduction to you and your work, I referenced what you had written in your poet's biography in the Poetry P website. You said that after your MFA in poetry in 2018, you dove into haiku as a means of creative recovery. Now, I've noticed that a haiku are really useful when you're in physical or mental pain, but I'm, I don't think that's what you were referring to. Can you tell us a little bit about what you meant? Absolutely. Um, and haiku really actually like it's one of those things that I would come to and then drift away from and come to and drift away from and uh, then after my MFA it really did seem to just stick Um, and I think part of it is um, you know I don't I don't want to demonize the whole uh, MFA program culture because I know a lot of people have loved their experience they've been really helped by it Um, I was not the the pressure to produce ended up not being good for me. I've actually weirdly always been, a, I've always been a self-motivated person, but then being in a thing where for three years, you just have to do it uh, on someone else's timetable. Uh, that was not good for me. Um, I was also just in a program that ultimately ended up not being in a good, a, a good fit at all. Um, and I stuck with it because you'd already thrown in time and money. And uh, I, I was after that MFA for career reasons, Um, And then it ended up just burning me out, totally burning me out. I didn't write anything for a long time except haiku because I had a friend, I had done a 
an online MFA. And I had a friend in that program who lived in Japan and actually one of his haiku is part of my presentation. And when I was a year ahead of him and when I realized, oh, we're not gonna have any classes together anymore. I said, well, do you wanna just do a haiku exchange every week? And he said, yes. And you know, we're, we're not as diligent about it as we said we'd be, but we're pretty diligent about it. Uh, so we've been sending each other uh, uh, an original haiku more or less every week for a, a long time, like seven years, six or seven years now. And so I, so for a while I'd be like, I'm not writing. And I was like, no way I'm writing haiku. I'm, I'm sending a haiku every week, even if it's terrible, even if I think it's the worst thing I've ever written, I'm sending it to my friend because I said I would. Um, and so haiku was the one thing that I'm, that kept me going as a writer. And then I just, the more I wrote haiku and, you know, my friend Warren would send me haiku and I just kept falling deeper in love with it. And, uh, then I joined a uh, haiku society of America and a bunch of my poet friends were deep in haiku. Um, I joined the haiku Austin haiku study group. And from there, it just, it just took off. And there's something about, I think for better or for worse, you know, at least for now, haiku exists outside of the standard, uh, what people call the pobiz or the poetry business or the, you know, a uh, really academic approach to poetry. Certainly there are some, you know, academics who write haiku. And it was very funny in 2015, um, there was a, a piece in Frog Pond about how we need to get haiku more mainstream. And I was like, I don't know. I kind of like the fact that it's not. And like, there's none of this pressure of um, you get, you don't, you get to put haiku on your CV and you get fellowships in, in haiku. I'm like, I kind of love that. It. It's just I still write poetry, but I'm free of all of that baggage, basically. That's, I mean, you've touched on on so many interesting things there. I mean, as, as we talked about doing this presentation today, you've already given me one topic, one extra topic to, to do, monocu <laughs> and punctuation. Um, and then from what you've said, it's, it's so true. I'm having a bit of a, a writer's block at the moment. But I write haiku. Well, they're all terrible at the moment. But I keep writing because eventually some little spark will happen. And um, haiku are just super for that to keep you ticking over. Anyway, today's not about my, my writer's block. Um, it's about your presentation. And <laughs> punctuation has fascinated me for a while now. And because we've works you've sent me the, the presentation beforehand I know it's going to be a super one so I'm going to hand over to you and I will see you at the end all right so I am here today to talk about punctuation in haiku which I know can be a pretty loaded topic for a lot of us uh haiku people um and uh the reason I wanted to do this workshop is I wanted to show how contemporary English language haiku poets use punctuation uh, and help you decide whether you want to use punctuation in your haiku and when to do so. I'm not an all or nothing person. Uh, you don't have to reject it. You don't have to use it. I think it varies on a, a poem by poem basis. And I want you at the end of this to feel confident that if you wanna add punctuation to your haiku, haiku toolbox, you could. Uh, and I do wanna to clarify today, I'm focusing primarily on, on three line haiku. Uh, we, we did, uh, talk a little bit about Monaco, uh, but again, I'm a, I'm a technical uh, writer by, uh, by trade. So my whole thing is don't overwhelm the audience. Uh, now, if you want to send Monaco with punctuation to the journal, definitely consider it. Um, but the workshop is focused on uh, the three liners. Also, not only am I a technical writer, I am a little bit of a sociologist at heart. I find data fascinating. Uh, so I actually went and collected an assortment of 100 three-liners li three published uh, in print and online from 2015 to 21, and I created some charts showing some trends. Now, this is not a statistically significant sample size. Uh, I'm just one person. I don't have a haiku data team, uh, but it does really, it does reflect what I generally see in my reading of contemporary haiku. But again, I want to qualify. It's not statistically significant. Um, but I thought 100 was a nice round number. <laughs> so punctuation for your haiku, haiku toolbox. 
First, uh, yes, it is a it can be a hot topic. Uh, some haiku practitioners believe that haiku uh, that punctuation has no place in haiku. And in my own journey, I definitely in my earlier haiku years, I I did use punctuation. Uh, and then after someone said you shouldn't do that, I'm also a very like serious, trusting person. So I said, okay, then I won't do that. So for about three years, I didn't. I I, I can't just not do something if I feel it's the right thing to do. Um, and now this person, they meant well, and they had a reason for telling me not to use punctuation. And this person really believed that if the words were well chosen, the images were in the right order, then punctuation would not be necessary and it would just make things too easy for the reader. My reading of contemporary haiku in English shows me that a number of poets find value in punctuating their work. And I'm one of them, I've definitely gone back to it thinking about the history of things. Now, many English language translators used what I call standard English language prose punctuation in their renditions of classic haiku. So things were structured as sort of a standard sentence with the commas where the commas would go, the periods where the periods would go. And early English language haiku poets such as Richard Wright also used standard English punctuation in their haiku. And in one of, I think it was the last or second to last episode of uh, series four, Stanford M. Forrester has some thoughts on this. So you should definitely go back and listen to that. In my own practice, I, I do still see uh, English punctuation in haiku translations on, well into the 1990s, including from translators fluent in Japanese. And now just a note, because I don't want anyone, you know, I have my opinions and my thoughts and I don't want anyone who loves their standard punctuation to feel ashamed of that or that they should not do it. If that is what you prefer in your haiku, go with it. Again, I don't want anyone to feel bad about the way they choose to write haiku. These are reflections from my practice and my study. Punctuation does have a bad rap among uh, you know, some practitioners. And I, I think that a lot of that comes from the historical use of punctuation in translation. Um, the more I read, the more I feel that punctuating haiku the way one would punctuate a standard English sentence, that does have a tendency to overwhelm such a short poem. Now, punctuation doesn't inherently make things too easy for the reader. It doesn't inherently overwhelm the text. Uh, but the punctuation of structures of English just often seem a little bit intrusive when you're thinking about a brief poem. And given the landscape of what I'm seeing in contemporary haiku, I think some poets find that that standard English punctuation also looks a little outdated. And uh, I think we can see this also reflected in translation. Uh, if we look at, so for example, the same haiku in multiple translations, we can actually see a general tendency to reduce or eliminate that English punctuation over the course of 50 years or so. And of course, our reading habits, our teachers, our individual preferences, and the time and place in which we live, these all contribute to our poetic tendencies, including our likes and dislikes. Those of us who have come of age as writers in the last 20 or 30 years, we've written in an era where uh, punctuation, punctuation in haiku was becoming minimal or even non-existent. So for certain generations of readers and writers, heavy use of punctuation doesn't necessarily feel natural. So I'm gonna actually show this with uh, a series of, of translations. And these translations are approximations. Uh, they may be off by a year or two. Not all of the anthologies I have had uh, reliable initial publication dates. So I just did my best. So forgive me, not intending to mislead anyone. <laughs> it's just doing the best with what I have. So over here, we've got our, our uh, good, uh, good friend Blythe. The old pond, a frog jumps in, the sound of water. Semicolon, M dash, period. So one, one uh, punctuation in every line. We've got Allen Ginsberg, roughly 1978. The old pond, a frog jumped in, kerplunk, comma, and exclamation point. William J. Higginson, 1985, Old Pond, a frog leaps in water sound. So just the ellipses. And then these last two have no punctuation. We've got Sam Hamill in 1995, at the ancient pond, 
a frog plunges into the sound of water. And Jane Reichold in uh, 2002, old pond, a frog jumps into the sound of water. So obviously translations all vary in, in many ways, but one of the things that I was interested in was seeing how just the trend in punctuation did evolve. We could probably say some things about the capitalization too, but again, that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> so what is the value of punctuation in haiku? Well, I think that deliberate and thoughtful use of punctuation can augment the sense of contrast or tension between images. And it's useful for guiding the reader to slow down or stop on the page. It can stand as a substitute for what would be conveyed by pauses or breath when reading out loud. And uh, contemporary translators of Japanese haiku often use punctuation to stand in for the kireji or cutting word, which is a type of sound symbol that doesn't have an easy analog in English. And pardon my Japanese pronunciation, it's mediocre. So types of punctuation. I'm not gonna go through every type of punctuation in the English language, although I could. Uh, but today I'm really thinking about pauses versus hard stops. So when we think of our pauses, we've got commas, semicolons, colons, and em dashes. And these different punctuation marks tend to uh, cause different lengths of a pause. Commas tend to create the shortest ones and em dashes the longest. And contemporary English haiku does seem to favor pauses over hard stops. And there's a, there's, there's a chart on that in a moment. When I say stops, I'm talking about our periods, exclamation points, question marks, the things we would use to end um, an independent clause or a, a longer sentence. So periods and exclamation points, these, I, I, when I read them, for me, they directly disrupt the flow of the poem, especially if they're in the first or second line. And the line breaks in haiku are a form of stop as well. And adding a period or exclamation point uh, really can heighten that impact. A question mark also serves as an end stop, but I think it creates more of a sense of continued openness. And we'll see that in the example haiku I have in a little bit. Punctuation tendencies. Out of 100 haiku, we have uh, us English language uh, haiku writers, uh, we have this uh, pretty solid uh, preference for the M dash. And uh, with uh, ellipses not too far behind, then colons, some people do like a multiple types of punctuation. Some people like their exclamation points, commas, uh, and a few with question marks. And here's an example. Before they were my daughters, wildflowers. It's Meredith Aykroyd from Frog Pond 44.3. If you're just listening to this on the podcast, it is an uh, ellipses at the end of the second line. And that for me creates a pause that heightens the surprise of the final image. I remember when I first read this, I was not expecting wildflowers to be that third line. The pause extends and it really kind of softens the line break. Um, the reader doesn't stop hard, but they also, they can't rush onto the next line. It creates a sense of length in that second line without adding extra syllables. Um, and actually, in that way, punctuation can be a useful tool for those who really prefer minimalist haiku. Um, so to keep it from being feeling maybe a little too clipped. Before they were my daughters, wildflowers. My hand takes them down the sledding hill, the legendary one. Uh, Randy Brooks from the Ohio Haiku Anthology. So it's a comma at the end of the second line and the slight pause gives the reader an extra beat to pause, making the impact of the legendary one more dramatic. And my interpretation of the comma is that while it heightens the drama, it also creates a sense of intimacy. The pause seems conversational. I think it cultivates a sense of being in the know. Maybe that's because I'm from Ohio and I like to think I know that I know which hill he's talking about. And in my reading of this haiku, the pause doesn't need to be dramatic because the presumed listener knows what the speaker is talking about. My hand takes them down the sledding hill, the legendary one. River Delta, 
my foster mom's fingers entwined with mine. Hifsa Asraf, Kingfisher three. It's an M dash at the end of the first line and it creates a long pause, reading, really leaving the reader anticipating what is to come. Uh, the connections and branchings of a river delta provide an image that heightens the image of foster mom and child holding hands. And a river delta can also evoke the image of veins on the back of a hand. And the river delta is, I think, I think it's a less common association for family than a tree. And the fact that it is a fresh image makes that haiku extra compelling. The pause heightens the juxtaposition of the enjoined river and enjoined hands. River Delta, my foster mom's fingers entwined with mine. All right, another example with end stops. So this is from my friend Warren Decker. This has never been published. This came from our email correspondence. Be there then. Click here now. The first time I read that, I laughed so hard. Uh, the double exclamation point creates hard stops at the end of each line of this uh, two-liner. And in this piece, Warren has created a senryu that illustrates the intensity of contemporary life, specifically with regard to rushing through the day and having a shortened attention span. The punctuation choice uh, reinforces the sense of urgency as well as the sense of satire that Warren brings to the poem. And I personally find that exclamation point often adds humor to the haiku. I don't think it has to, but I find if I'm consciously giving myself an exercise to write with exclamation points, I end up writing funnier ones, which is probably good for me. Be there then, click here now. An empty homestead. How many pathways were there under all these weeds? Ayaz Daryl Nielsen, Cattails, April 2020. Question marks, do you have a special quality of resolving a grammatical statement while also allowing for openness? And when I read this poem, I envision the vast expanse of a farmhouse surrounded by miles of agricultural fields. And the question mark accentuates that feeling of space. A question mark has a specific job, which is to create a sense of wonder. And when combined with well-honed lines and word choices, the punctuation brings the reader into the space of questioning, confusion, or contemplation. An empty homestead, how many pathways were there under all these weeds? So now let's think about the placement of punctuation, because where we put our marks matters. So we can put them within certain points in the line, the beginning, the middle, or the end. Punctuation at the end or the beginning slows the transition between images. And punctuation in the middle of, is rare. Overwhelmingly, again, out of a out of a hundred haiku, virtually all had the punctuation at the end of the line. A couple had it in multiple spots, but there's a strong tendency for at the end. All right, and then which line do we choose? Punctuation in the first or second line, again, that can heighten the sense of juxtaposition between the two images, depending on how you've structured your poem. And punctuation in that third line can create a sense of closure in the case of a stop or tension and mystery in the case of a pause. And again, in my reading experience, I see a trend toward placing punctuation in the first line with punctuation uh, in the second line, not too far behind. So in my survey of 100 haiku, and uh, nearly 64% of people had it in the first line, and then uh, about 26% in the second line, a few, some on multiple lines, and not many people putting it in the third line. So some examples. Cricket weather, the first chirp of the smoke alarm. Angela Terry from Kingfisher 3. So here we've got an M dash at the end of the first line. And this makes us pause before we move into the second image. The pause invites us to slow down and think what cricket weather might entail. It's usually late summer or early fall, but can vary based on where you live. Uh, the pause makes the second image all the more compelling and humorous. And from a grammatical standpoint, putting the M dash at line two, I don't think it would have worked as well. So I, I think that in terms of the way English works, that end of that first line really was the right choice. 
cricket weather, the first chirp of the smoke alarm. Six crows at the bus stop, southbound. Linda L. Ludwig, this was from Poetry P Journal, autumn 2021. So we've got an M dash at the end of the first line and the beginning of the third line. And that pause creates a sense of mirroring. The double pause reinforces the two image, that of a southbound bus stop and that of birds preparing to fly south for winter. And by pausing twice, the reader is invited to sink into this haiku moment, the birds and an autumn urban landscape. The bus serves as a linchpin around which the first and third lines revolve. Six crows at the bus stop, southbound. Just when I thought the day was gray, a blue jay swoops over the lilac. Doris Lynch, Poetry P Journal, Autumn 2021. So here we've got an M dash about two thirds of the way through the second line. Uh, and that M dash in, in the, within the second line makes the whole line feel complete, even with an enjambment between the second and third lines. Sometimes the use of enjambment in haiku can create an unhelpful sense of fragmentation. Again, I know there are people who, are, who just say, don't use enjambment ever. I, I don't say you should never use it. Um, I've definitely seen enjambment used uh, skillfully, but it can create a sense of fragmentation that doesn't always work as well. Um, but I, th I think that M dash really helps avoid that issue. With the M dash, we also get the sudden appearance of the Blue Jay in the line. That line feels resolved, even though the thought isn't complete until the third line. And I think this is an example of a haiku in which punctuation can enhance other literary devices or techniques. Just when I thought, the day was gray, a blue jay swoops over the lilac. Two brothers tear the sky from the lake. Fly fishing. Ava C. Cipri, Frog Pond 39.2. So here we have ellipses in the uh, front of the third line. So the pause starts the line. And the punctuation location itself is a surprise. Again, we don't put a lot of punctuation at the start of the line. So it's a little unexpected just based on, I think, you know, our implicit assumptions about where punctuation goes. And rather than pausing right at the end of the second line, we have to jump between the lines, then pause. The image, tear the sky from the lake, it's not an obvious one. And the ellipses allow the reader to savor the uh, anticipation before getting that exclamation or explanation. Two brothers tear the sky from the lake, fly fishing. Slowing my heartbeat to the river's speed, a patch of comfrey. Matthew Paul, Kingfisher Three. So in Prose, a colon is used to draw a reader's attention to the information that follows. Here we've got a colon at the end of the second line. And in this haiku, the colon clearly draws our attention to the comfrey in the third line. We can't avoid it. And while one might feel that the use of the colon is heavy handed, in my opinion, the use of the punctuation here emphasizes how much of an effect the comfrey had when Matthew Paul, Paul saw it. I feel like the colon is really emphasizing what a calming sight that comfrey is. Slowing my heartbeat to the river's speed, a patch of comfrey. So now I'm uh, putting one of my haiku under the test. So I've got one haiku three ways. So the original, I have an M dash at the end of the first line. After a nightmare, hearing white winged doves foreshadow sunrise. After a nightmare, hearing white winged doves foreshadow sunrise. Variation one has a semicolon at the end of the line. After a nightmare, hearing white winged doves foreshadow sunrise. After a nightmare, hearing white winged doves foreshadow sunrise. Variation two has a comma. After a nightmare, hearing white-winged doves 
for Shadow Sunrise. After a nightmare, hearing white winged doves for Shadow Sunrise. I actually think I wrote this one with no punctuation at the start and then I added it because I deliberately wanted there to be a longer pause between that the, those two images of the jolt of, of waking from a nightmare and being sort of distressed and confused and it's it's, it's dark um, and you're in that weird liminal space where you're like aware you've had a nightmare but you haven't come back yet and then you realize oh daylight is coming I can I can hear the birds starting to sing I wrote this at my old house where there were just a ton of birds in the yard and if I did wake up before sunrise I would I would know that you know morning is almost here when I could hear the, hear the birds starting to sing and in the other two variations a semicolon creates you know it creates a, a good pause but it's not visually as dramatic as the m dash and so I don't think you end up pausing as well uh, as long and you definitely don't with the comma so for me when I go back to it I say yes that m dash was still the right choice because I wanted that I did want that dramatic pause and the uh but I didn't want the hard stop so I like the m dash still because it's most dramatic so to conclude some strategies for your haiku practice first Break the rules. If you have been told that you shouldn't use a specific type of punctuation mark, give yourself permission to break the rules. Certainly some of us have been told never use punctuation, but then there will be, um, even then there'll be people who are okay with punctuation, but not an exclamation point. The exclamation point has a pretty bad rap. <laughs> so that was actually one of mine was giving myself permission to use the exclamation point. And that's actually what I do in a live workshop. I make everyone uh, draft haiku with an exclamation point because so many people think they shouldn't. And so we're like, we're just, we're just gonna get, get that over with. <laughs> also experiment with location write uh, different versions of the same haiku, observing what happens when you use punctuation in different places in the poem. How does, uh, maybe try it in the first line and then in the second line, and what is the effect? Or experiment with the type of mark, which is what I did with my own poem. Write different versions of the same haiku, uh, keeping your punctuation in the same place and observing what happens when you try different punctuation marks. So for me, trying the two other types of pause reinforced my uh, decision that the M dash was the right one. And the goal of these uh, these exercises, this is, is not necessarily to write the best haiku of your life. I don't think that's what a writing exercise is for. Uh, to me, it's just to deliberately experiment with something. And in this case, we're going to be deliberately experimenting with punctuation in haiku and observing the results. And you might discover, um, you know, I really love exclamation points and I'm going to give myself permission. Or, you know, uh, I had this haiku that wasn't working, but when I stick an M dash at the beginning of the second line, you know, it looks weird, but it's actually doing what I wanted to do. And I love it. Um, so you might find things you like, or you might say, you know what? I just never want to deal with periods in haiku ever. Ugh. And that is okay as well. Again, we are, uh, we're observing our process and the results and uh, how we feel about it. Thank you very much, Alison. I'm so pleased you put the question mark in there. Because as I said to you before, I love a question mark. <laughs> Don't write many myself with question marks, but I do love them. And I was really intrigued. I don't know American geography terribly well. So you have to tell me, you feel you know this hill um, in Randy's haiku. Mm -hmm. Has Ohio only got one hill? No, it's just, you know, Ohio is, I mean, Ohio is a pretty big state, but now that I've lived in Texas, Ohio is not a big state, right? Um, so, you know, there are, there are a couple of hills in Ohio, but there's really just like two or three that are known as the really good ones. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's gonna be one of them. Fair enough. Just, it's gotta be one of those. Okay. I was <laughs> like, just intrigued. Even if I don't know the exact one, it's you know, it's I can guess. <laughs> yeah. And then I had a, just a, a, co a comment on the comfrey because you you don't know it. It grows here quite well, yeah. and it's for people with gardens. Gardens, if you get a load of comfrey and soak it in water, 
and then filter it off, filter the water off. It's very good fertilizer, a natural fertilizer. Oh. Just there you are. And we'll we'll do a gardening podcast one day. The other thing I wanted to say is what a shame Warren's poem isn't published because it's it's a great and the exclamation points they really make the poem, don't they? In that yeah, one. they do. Well, and I, I got his permission to use it. So, you know, he's, he was totally on board with it being on the podcast. He was pretty excited about it. So, <laughs> well, hopefully, you'll listen and know how much I love it. I would just like to say that was a, a, a great presentation. And what I love about these workshops uh, is not just that I learn stuff, but I get to hear haiku that maybe I've read before and maybe I haven't, but they're sort of, they come new to me hearing it through another poet's voice. And I love that. And I love the examples you gave me. And I'm so pleased that you pointed out in the examples you gave where the punctuation was, because it hadn't occurred to me. <laughs> no, this is the thing I've been worried about ever since uh, you uh, took me up on my offer to talk about punctuation. I'm like, oh my God, but how are we going to do this on a podcast? <laughs> no. It's a good point that really hadn't occurred to me until you started pointing that out. I thought, oh, thank goodness one of us has switched on. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I just figured, you know, I, I, I'm like, I, I can't be the only person who's had this problem. So it'll work out. <laughs> I'm not going to let a little thing like lack of uh, visual capacity stop me. <laughs> Excellent. That's what I'd like to hear. So Alison, thank you. Thank you very much. I know you're coming back on the podcast because you're going to actually be one of the community judges for this. Yeah, I'm so excited for that. <laughs> so, so, so everyone. Alison's coming back and she wants to see evidence that you've listened to her <laughs> workshops. <laughs> Let's get that punctuation going. Thank you very, very much Thank indeed, you. Alison. Take care and uh, we'll see you again soon. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you enjoyed that presentation. I know I did. As with so many of our workshops, one workshop suggests another. And I really think we have to come back and look at Monaco as a separate entity with regards to punctuation. Don't you? Next month, we're going to be writing haiku with punctuation using the pointers that Alison has given us. The submission period is the 1st to the 15th of March. And Alison has encouraged you to play and see what difference punctuation makes to your poetry. Please do have a play and send us the best of your results. Tell all your friends we're open for Haiku and Senryu. Keep us busy. And again, one last plea. Please, please volunteer to be community judges. I really need you. So, until next time, keep writing. You should find all the info you need in the show notes, but if I've left anything out or you need more, do let me know and I'll put it right. Ciao!